This is a special edition of the Cram Podcast, a warning that some descriptions are graphic, depicting scenes of genocide and violence. This is probably not suitable for children. Well, there have been very few times when I have been speechless in my life, as you can imagine. But reading the book, An Imperfect Offering by Dr. James Urbinski, was one of them. His book recounts the worst of the worst, Somalia during civil war and famine, Afghanistan as the Taliban came to power, the horrific genocide in Rwanda, the collapse of Zaire, humans at their worst. But his story is also about humans at their best, offering the greatest gift possible, their life to help the lives of others. And James Orbinski was one of them. He spent years with Médecins Sans Frontières on the front lines of aid and received the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the organization back in 1999. He launched successful initiatives that tackled large-scale problems in public health, and he founded Dignitas International, a medical and research organization to carry on this work. James is currently the director of the Dadala Institute for Global Health Research at York University, and he joins us today. Thanks very much for coming on, James. It's a real honor to have you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, Mary. Thank you. Yeah, I was very captivated um, when you talked about your childhood and growing up in a working class neighborhood in Montreal. And I wonder if you could just talk briefly about some of those early influences that would have set you on a path of humanitarian work? Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's always difficult to answer a, a, that kind of question because there's no one sort of influence. There, there are many. Um, and, but I think probably the most important um, would be the foundational influence uh, of my life, which is my family, uh, the family that I grew up in. Uh, and uh, my mother, my father, uh, the, the tone that they set for our family life, uh, the tone that they set for knowing our history, uh, and the tone that they set for maintaining relationships with our extended family. Um, uh, th those are really, really important in the sense that um, just in my particular case, uh, both my parents were born and raised in Ireland. Uh, despite my name, Orbinski, that's a very long story, which I won't go into. But but both my parents were, were born and raised in Ireland. Um, my mother just outside Dublin and my father in uh, uh, Templemore, just outside, just as a small town in Tipperary, County Tipperary. Uh, and so my extended family is in Ireland. Uh, and um, uh, it was very important for my parents uh, that we maintain um, a relationship with our extended family. And that also we understand our history. So you ended up becoming a medical doctor and you um, first went to Rwanda on a research fellowship in 1987, and it was to study HIV AIDS in children. And when I was reading that part of the book, um, what struck me was uh, your, your attitude on that first visit, because you said that at that time, you fell in love with the world of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk about what your mindset was like back then? Yeah. Um, so I went uh, as a research fellow. Um, I was fascinated uh, with immunology. Uh, I had been very fortunate to have an excellent tutor uh, in medical school uh, who uh, was uh, an immunologist at Jack Rosenfeld. Uh, and um, the biggest disease at that time in the world uh, for for uh, uh, children, especially, uh, was HIV. Uh, and nothing was known about HIV at that time, and most especially um, in children. And uh, I was deeply fascinated with the, the the incredible complexity and beauty of of, of immunology. Uh, and um, uh, Jack very much urged me to to explore that in great detail. And so I did. And um, <clears throat> I went to Rwanda because uh, Rwanda at that time had one of the highest prevalences of HIV in children uh, in the world. And uh, 
I was like many at the time trying to understand um, the clinical manifestations of HIV in children. So even that wasn't clear at the time. Uh, and what are the relationships between the clinical manifestations of the disease uh, and immunology? And that could be really helpful in terms of diagnosing, managing, and treating uh, kids with, with HIV. So I went to Rwanda, and um, um, I won't go into the details of the research, uh, but the experience completely changed my view of what I could do as a, as a physician. And until that time, uh, I uh, wanted to be a pediatrician, be a, a pediatric immunologist. Um, but when I went to Rwanda, um, I did some, uh, uh, some really, really interesting, uh, research. Uh, but it was, the research was, became a kind of a vehicle for me to understand, um, the full range of possibility, uh, that, that I could mm -hmm. explore as a, as a, as a physician. And what was obvious to me was that there were, there was enormous unmet need. Uh, I realized, uh, that, um, there was a massive deficit uh, in the number of doctors relative to 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 the needs of, of of people, and most especially for children, and most especially for maternal child health. Um, and so, just to sort of paint a picture, I remember being, for example, at the hospital in Kigali um, every morning at seven o'clock. I would go to the, to the, the pediatric clinic, and there would be literally hundreds of women sitting outside of the clinic. Um, uh, sitting all the way down the street uh, for as far literally as you could see. And those women were with their children. And it was usually one of their children that was quite sick. And they were, they had come to the hospital uh, to see the, to see the doctor. And they had come to the hospital because there were no other doctors uh, in the villages or in, uh, even in the city, there were very, very few doctors. Um, and I very much remember, you know, that, that, a feeling of just being overwhelmed that, that, um, no matter how hard I work, no matter how long I stay at the clinic, every time I look out the window, there's still hundreds of women lined up and sitting down with their kids. And so that really changed my, my, um, my understanding, if you will, that uh, of, of what I could do, that I could focus on one small, uh, issue and, and the micro, detail of immunology uh, as it relates to HIV in kids, uh, or I could focus more broadly. A and um, uh, I realized that, that there were many people in the world, um, like myself, uh, who were interested in immunology um, and immunology of pediatric HIV, but there was hardly anyone that was interested in a, a broader perspective. And I thought, well, so I can, I can do this. Right. I can focus on, on a broader perspective. So what I did in, in that time was in addition to the research on HIV, I developed a whole series of algorithms, uh, for, um, for nurses, uh, around, um, the top 10, um, presentations of problems. Um, so fever, diarrhea, rash, cough. Uh, these are the things that people, that mothers come to the clinic, uh, with. And that's what they tell you that their child had. And if you actually, from a clinical medical perspective, if you, if you take any one of those problems, there's actually a very systematic way of thinking through those problems uh, and um, reaching a diagnosis and therefore a treatment. And that systematic way can be defined in an algorithm. Uh, and, and hold it, you, you created those algorithms? Well, at the time, in the late eighties, that's, yeah, that it was, it was, let's call them decision trees. It's probably a better word. Oh. Algorithm is just another yeah. adaptation of a decision tree, right? Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. It's not really much more complicated than that. So I created uh, a series of decision trees. Um, and I, I, um, uh, wrote these out, uh, and then, um, uh, tested them. Uh, and w among nurses and among doctors and refine them, uh, so that we have a little manual of the top 10, uh, clinical presentations for children. And then we trained nurses on how to, um, <clears throat> how to use the algorithms to make decisions. And so suddenly, uh, if you train a hundred nurses, you have, 
a uh, hundred people who can treat thousands of kids with the 10 most common problems. And then the, the problems that are either too complex or don't f- fall within the range of those, those 10, those are the ones that should be referred to, to the doctor, right? Uh, who can think through things in a more complex way because they have more knowledge. And, and what I learned from that was that, that, you know, what, first of all, if you're careful and systematic about knowledge and how you share that knowledge with others, uh, you can have an enormous impact. And the other thing that I learned was that, um, you know, the thinking that, that, uh, um, imbues even today much of, of medical science uh, and medical practice uh, is that only super smart people can do this. And that is simply not true. And it's also not true that people who aren't very highly educated aren't super smart. Just because you're not educated does not mean you're not smart. What it means is that um uh, there's there is a real possibility that if you do this correctly, if you tra- if you develop the right tools and you train a person who is very smart but not necessarily very educated, you can train that person to do a very very good job uh, on management of basic medical problems. And I took that same learning and applied it to um, HIV in Malawi um, many years later. Uh, and I also took the same learning and applied it inside MSF uh, um, to develop clinical management strategies uh, for the most common problems. Uh, and um, um, that's what I learned in the first sort of iteration of, of my experience in, in Rwanda. Yeah, I, you know, what struck me uh, about that trip, though, was when you came back, you said that your first questions, they weren't medical ones. But yeah. they were moral and political questions. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And to me, that was almost, um, uh, an indicator of what was still to come. And, you know, are those questions, those moral and political ones, are those really the most difficult ones to answer? Well, they are. They're, they're, and they're, they're, they're living questions. Uh, and you, you have to, uh, you have to, enter into the question and into the challenge that the question poses. And just to give you an example, I remember in that very first experience in, in Rwanda, um, being at a small clinic in, in a very, very remote area where um, I would go every week. And um, every single week, there would be children w- who were profoundly malnourished. And I would have to treat those kids. And I would do it. One of the treatments involved inserting a nasal gastric tube, a tube up their, their nose that you gradually insert. And then it goes down into their, into the baby's, into the child's stomach. And then through that tube, you, uh, you inject, um, aliquots of, of food that's very carefully, uh, constructed. Right. And, and you also add medicine and so on so that the child will get through the first week of malnutrition, which is the most critical week. You can actually kill a child if you feed a child too quickly, uh, a child that is, that is malnourished. So you have to, it's a very precise kind of process. I remember sitting there, it was dark and it was, um, kind of cool inside, but very hot outside. Um, and I remember looking out the window, sitting on this little bench, waiting for the child to calm down, waiting for the mother to soothe the child. And I looked out the window and I could see every possible shade of green that you could imagine. It was absolutely beautiful. It was like a Van Gogh painting, you know, just beautiful, you know, framed by this mud, with this mud wall. And then I thought, well, what is that? Why is there so much complexity to that greenery? And what it was was um, tea and coffee. So people were growing tea and coffee on the hills and the mountains around the, the clinic. And it, it just struck me at that point that, you know, this is the most fertile ground on the continent of Africa, which it was and is. Um, and people are growing cash crops. They're going, they're growing tea and coffee. It's not that they don't have soil and good soil. Why are they growing tea and coffee? They're, they were growing tea and coffee because of World Bank policies on structural adjustment 
that uh, mandated uh, that the government uh, ensure a certain amount of production for of tea and coffee for global markets. And it, so the, the connection in my mind between that child, me, and that little nasogastric tube and the World Bank uh, was just right there, right? And I remember feeling, you know, I can, I can do this. I can put this feeding tube into this child and I can do it for this child and I can do it for, you know, thousands of children. And I will do that. But I have to do it in a manner that um, is not ignorant of the causes and conditions that have created this circumstance, right? So I have to be aware of the broader issues. And it was very much that kind of experience that led me uh, uh, to look for a, an organization uh, that uh, did not kind of dissociate the medical, technical medical practice from the politics that create the causes and conditions where uh, very specific types of apparently humanitarian medical action uh, exist. And that led me to MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières. And I, I realized that, that that organization, the idea that somehow uh, uh, the doctor has a responsibility to, to understand not just the techno-scientific issues, but the political issues that create those causes and conditions where humanitarian medical intervention is necessary, that understanding uh, is, is uh, uh, seen by MSF as fundamental to the Humanitarian Act. Uh, and is also fundamental to bearing witness uh, to what you see and to what you do. Uh, and so um, that very much led me to MSF. And so I left my pediatrics program and I joined MSF essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and the rest of it is 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 history. I, I, yeah, I like to talk about some of that history, about your experiences going on missions with MSF. Uh, I mentioned, you know, Somalia, uh, Rwanda, you went a second time as chief uh, of the MSF mission, Afghanistan. I mean, there were, there were other missions as well. I, that part of the book is, is deeply disturbing. And I, and I'm just a reader. And, um, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're talking a couple of decades now, right? Ago. And I don't know what it's like for you to recount those experiences at this point. That's got to be difficult. Well, I think the challenge is to make events that are profoundly disturbing, um, to understand them and to understand why they're disturbing uh, to you, to, in my case, to me, um, and to make them part of your story. Right. Part of your own conscious understanding of your own life. Right. And your own uh, experience of life. Uh, and to, um, they don't necessarily have to be the most important anchor point in your life, but they're part of your life. And they, they in, in my case, they have changed me. Uh, and to the extent that I have grappled with them, uh, and really tried to understand them. Uh, is the extent to which I have become even more, you know, committed, if you will, uh, to uh, engaging um, uh, uh, the world uh, in a manner that really tries to uh, facilitate uh, humanitarian assistance. But I think it's quite important to to really grapple with those things, with those experiences. In my case, and to to um, uh, however difficult, and it was difficult, and is. I mean, there are still times where I think of things and I experience, you know, just. I'm sure. This great mm -hmm. sense of of of, um, you know, of of um, how to put it, a great sense of of um, being overwhelmed. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I wonder. Can you, can James? Can you, can can you speak about um, any of those experiences you had? Um, their their impact on you in so many ways. I mean, um, as an aid worker, as a doctor, as a man, as a human. I mean, what what experiences can you share with us that were incredibly impactful and insightful for you? Yeah, um, I, I mean, one of the most shocking things was during the genocide in Rwanda 
in 1994. So I had gone back uh, after my initial uh, time there. Um, and um, I had gone, this was in the capital city of Kigali. I had gone to, to uh, an orphanage uh, where uh, there was uh, a collection of kids, a lot of kids uh, that were being looked after by a priest. Uh, and um, uh, these children were, were, were Chutsi. Uh, and uh, the killing squads, the Interahamwe killing squads that were, were actually um, conducting, if you will, the genocide, um, they they were particularly cruel um, in the sense that you know, they wanted, if they wanted, they did want to kill all of those children because they were Tutsi, but they didn't want to just kill them. They wanted them to suffer, uh, and um, so they would kill a few every night and then they would throw the bodies over the wall back into the orphanage um and after having killed them you know with 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 a machete and you know dismembered them and and so on they would throw body parts back over the wall into the orphanage and so in the first instance that you know that rational cruelty it it really um struck me that that only human beings can do that animals don't do that but only human beings can be rationally cruel right and so that was just that was so hard for me to 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 grasp and i remember one day going to the orphanage in an armored personnel carrier uh, with uh, which was a UN, a Unimir uh, uh, armored personnel carrier, going through the city and going to this orphanage and trying to, uh, um, once I arrived, I was trying to convince a commander um, to let me take the kids to the hospital, right? Um, and uh, I remember he said, uh, these are not children. These are Inyenze which is Kenya Rwanda for insects. These are insects and they will be crushed like insects. And I remember just seeing him and, and, and truly trying to understand how could he see them in that way, you know? And then I remember looking down at the, at the, at the, the soil and, um, I, you know, and I thought, oh, those are, why are there little sausages on, in the soil, you know? That was my first thought. And then I realized they're not sus, they're fingers, they're children's fingers that have been cut off uh, with a machete that were lying in the, in the soil. And I remember just saying to this man, this uh, saying, don't you have children? Like, how could you do this? Uh, and, um, and then that's when he said to me, these are not children. These are in Yenze. And I, I still remember that very vividly. And I still remember my own, uh, and I still feel, even as I describe it to you, I still feel my own kind of visceral uh, confusion and, and disgust mm. and, and um, uh, nausea uh, at, at um, that reality, you know, and, um, um, and somehow, uh, uh, you know, it still uh, is deeply confusing to me. <laughs> Um, yeah. as a, as a human being that, that, that this too is what we are capable of, right? And I am a human being, uh, in the same way that this man is a human mm -hmm. being. We're making, we are manifesting different intentions. There's no question, but I am also, um, uh, capable, uh, of, of, uh, um, eliciting or whatever, manifesting that particular perspective. And we know historically that as human beings, we have done this over and over and over again. And the Holocaust is just, the, I mean, it comes to mind immediately. Uh, you know, the, 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 the car, the, um, uh, uh, the bombing of, of uh, Aleppo uh, um, uh, during the Syrian civil war, the, the carpet bombing of that city and the, 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 the enormous, suffering that reflected on people um apparently in in a some sort of military rational kind of calculation that is completely divorced from from the reality of 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 the suffering that that inflicts 
I mm. still have enormous, I, I still grapple with that uh, every single day. Well, I remember too, you, you said that the genocide in Rwanda, you said, quote, was my undoing. What, what, yeah. what, what did you mean by that? My undoing? My undoing. Yeah. Um, I think, um, you know, to that point, I had held a very particular kind of worldview. I thought, you know, that, that, um, you know, there are structures, there's, there's norms, there's values, there's, there's ways of, of, of being ways that human beings organize themselves that ultimately, um, you know, require that you believe in those structures, uh, and that you, um, those institutions, as, as an example of a structure, they will, um, uh, function eventually to pursue, to, to create you know, uh, uh, or allow us to pursue the good, the just, and having the experience of 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 um, uh, of uh, the genocide in in Kigali, um, uh, it you know, the the world failed completely, uh, and not only failed, but um, those structures um, intentionally intentionally allowed the genocide to continue knowing that it was mm -hmm. in fact genocide. Uh, well, would you go so far as to say really complicit? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, yeah. That's, that's not even far. It's, mm -hmm. it's obvious, you know, absolutely yeah. complicit, you know, and there were also, uh, you know, certain nation states uh, that, that uh, were providing arms and intelligent France was providing arms yeah. and intelligence uh, to the Hutus uh, and to the to the to the um, RGF or the Rwandan government forces uh, at the time, and they were supporting um, the the then government uh, and a cabal of of people within the government, the Akuza as it was called, uh, that were absolutely clear about their goal, uh, which was genocide, and then at the same time. Um, in Rwanda at that time, there were also incredibly, um, I mean, incredibly, truly heroic uh, 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 efforts, and, yeah. and one that that I hope most Canadians, all Canadians, are aware of uh, is General Dallaire. I mean, he was just absolutely, truly heroic. Uh, and, um, you know, he, the, he disobeyed orders, you know, to withdraw. Uh, and he did what the United Nations as a community of actors should have done, right? Um, his approach, uh, should have been the approach of the community of nations, uh, toward the reality of, 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 uh, of genocide. Do you know, I cannot get out of my head uh, the scene where you were helping a woman who had been horribly mutilated. Um, and in fact, they had even scarred her face in a specific kind of pattern. Um, and I guess had left her to bleed to death. And you were trying to help her. And she actually said to you to go and to help others because she knew that there were all these other people that needed help as well. Yeah. Cause you, I think you had said that you had to go and she said, well, you got to go. So just you go. I, I just, yeah, that, was a, uh, um, that was a particularly, uh, uh, overwhelming circumstance. And, uh, what had happened was there were essentially, there were two hospitals in Kigali at the time and divided you know by a, or separated i should say by a front line and one side was tutsi territory and it was the faisal hospital which is where i was based and then the other side uh was uh the red cross hospital uh, and that was in hutu uh, uh rgf i should say i shouldn't say hutu but rgf territory uh and um msf we had a surgical team working in the uh, Red Cross Hospital. In fact, it was the only surgical team in the hospital. It was an MSF team. And um, so I was going back and forth um, across the, the, the front line with, with in an APC uh, um, uh, 
you know, with delivering medical supplies and things of that sort, and also trying to assess like how dangerous is this <laughs> mm-hmm. and should we move the team out and, you know, all of that. And, um, Anyway, on that particular day, uh, the RGF launched a major assault around the hospital. Uh, and there were literally hundreds and hundreds of casualties, uh, of people, uh, who were being, um, brought to the hospital and carried. And they were, we were completely overwhelmed. So we had to triage, uh, um, according to the severity of injury. And one woman was, was the person that you've just described. And it was a, Really, um, uh, it was just a, a truly overwhelming experience for me because I, I could see, um, you know, in the first instance, she had been terribly uh, assaulted, you know, with a, with a machete and they mm-hmm. had cut her Achilles tendons. They cut off her breasts. Uh, they had, uh, she had assault wounds all over her body. Um, her ears were gone. Um, and again, you know, this, this kind of rational cruelty, I, I still can't understand it. Uh, um, but she also had, uh, machete patterns cut into her face. And, um, uh, and I was trying to stitch up, uh, an abdominal wound and, and, um, um, anyway, I remember just looking up at her. And then just seeing all of this, you know, and, and I'd seen it previously, but somehow it was just that next moment. It all just, uh, I saw it all. Uh, and, um, I, uh, I just overwhelmed, you know, and I turned because I felt so sick and I vomited, in fact, uh, just from what I was seeing, you know, and it wasn't like, a, you know, it wasn't like I hadn't seen lots of, 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 of uh injury but it was just this person this this woman uh who had very very kind eyes i remember that and she she um she reached out and she touched me and um she said there's a rwanda words umara and that's what she said she said umara umara you know and what does it mean it means courage find your courage you have to get through this, you know, and you have to do this, you know, and, um, that's what it means. And it's Omara, Omara, you know, just stay strong, you know, and you must. She was be, telling you to stay strong. Was me, <laughs> oh. It was just, you know, it was, I mean, she could see that, that herself, she could see there were so many people, right. Who, who needed help. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, she could see that not only was she herself, uh, you know, in need, but she could see all of these others. Uh, and then she could also see that there was like, there was very few doctors. I mean, but there was a handful of us, the three, you know, and hundreds and hundreds of patients. And, um, so, uh, it was very much, uh, uh, just a profound moment for me personally. And, um, you know, I finished the speaking and, and went on to the next patient, you know? Uh, yeah. I, I just couldn't get over the woman's selflessness. I, I was it's just so remarkable. Yeah. Um, do you know, and it's interesting too, that you, it's almost like you offhandedly mentioned that there was a bounty on your head. And, and, and you never sort of referred to it. It was, oh, you might have actually, but not in any kind of serious way. I mean, someone told you that there, that this is, I guess, when you had now politically fell out of favor, right? MSF. Oh, um, sure. and they were offering $50 a limb or something for you. I mean, did that not concern you? Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would think so. Too. Um, but you know, uh, in, in such circumstances or in that particular circumstance, um, you know, we were only, MSF was only able to be there and to function, uh, because Unimare under General Delar's leadership, uh, had made the decision that it was going to stay. Right. And that it was going to do everything it could as a military actor 
and as a uh, UN uh, force uh, to um, protect uh, the humanitarians, in, 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 and and we were the only ones. I mean, it was just us, you know. And yeah. General Dallaire had repeatedly told me, um, you know, uh, that he will do whatever is necessary uh, to uh, protect us, and also um, without guarantee. I mean, the, you know, there's, there's, you, you never know what's going to happen, right? Uh, right. I mean, at one point they were down to 200 liters, literally, of diesel fuel, you know, for their APCs and their trucks. I mean, that's a that's really extreme circumstances. Um, but he was quite clear. And also, so too were all of the commanding off the other commanding officers who were all Canadian, by the way. Um, they were very clear uh, and they were also incredibly uh, careful uh, about. Uh, uh, where we would go, where they would let me go, uh, and they had obviously had much more knowledge of the of the, the military circumstances than I did. I certainly was very aware, uh, but they had much more intimate, sort of proximate knowledge of of those circumstances. So I had to trust them, uh, and I did trust them. And I think that's the that was the 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 um, the reality and the the key. You know, was that. I trusted uh, um, Unimare people on the ground, the soldiers on the ground. Um, and I knew that they would do everything they could, right, to, um, to protect me uh, and also to protect, you know, our, our teams. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a calculus, I guess, you know, and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, I did what I did, you know. And you went on as well, and um, well, you were involved in a number of um, successful campaigns, the Essential Medicines Campaign. Um, was that under the organization you created, Dignitas? No, no, that was no. NSF. So that was oh, an amazing okay. thing. We, we started, mm-hmm. uh, we called it the Access to Essential Medicines Campaign, and mm-hmm. we started it uh, in 1998, and um, after uh a great deal of very careful thinking and 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 analysis and uh, we launched it was a global campaign to increase access to essential medicines and um so for example medicines for hiv and that was the biggest global pandemic at the time and at that time um uh there were only 400,000 people in 1998 who were on treatment for hiv and they were all in the western world and the thinking, uh, the global public health thinking at that time uh, was uh, best uh, sort of demonstrated by then uh, Secretary of State Tommy Thompson for the United, United States, uh, who in reply to our demand that there, we increase access to essential medicines, to anti- antiretrovirals, the treatment for HIV, um, his reply was, you, you want to send antiretrovirals to, to Africa? Um, these people can't even tell the time. How can you expect them to take their medications properly? Now, that's not a you know, perfect quote, but that's essentially what he said. And it was extremely difficult, uh, but we were absolutely laser focused uh, on uh, achieving our goal. And we were very successful. We drove down the price uh, of antiretrovirals. Um, which were priced at around $12,500 a year, US dollars a year for patented versions of antiretrovirals to less than $200 for generic versions of exactly the same medicines. And we did that through this campaign. And that campaign also involved um, MSF essentially um, uh, trying to control the market. Uh, in antiretrovirals. And we did that by um, arranging very, very specific purchasing agreements uh, between um, uh, MSF and Indian pharmaceutical producers and South Korean pharmaceutical producers. And we also did it by um, purchasing the raw materials for the production of anti, uh, antiretrovirals 
and ensuring that the price by mass purchasing, we were able to ensure that the price of raw materials stayed at a level where it was possible for generic producers to produce at a volume that we required for the global south. And that changed the whole world in terms of uh, HIV. And it also really changed the whole concept of what is global health and how can, how does, how do we think about it? And then secondly, how do you operationalize that thinking into very practical initiatives to, to improve global health? Um, and so it, it was truly revolutionary in terms of, in terms of our, our, um, uh, our impact. Yeah. And then why did you go on to create Dignitas? What was the purpose? Yeah. So Dignitas was uh, very much an effort to focus on, um, uh, health systems, uh, and on, um, community based care. Uh, so bringing care for people with HIV and tuberculosis, by the way, it wasn't just HIV, bringing care for, for, uh, HIV and TB from the hospital to the community and doing it in a way, uh, that, uh, is highly, highly effective. Uh, and I talked earlier about algorithms. Well, that's what we did. Uh, we developed, uh, treatment algorithms, um, uh, for, uh, the treatment of HIV and TB in community by community health workers. Um, and that allowed us to, uh, essentially start and continue to treat 400,000 people, uh, in Malawi, uh, with HIV. Uh, and we handed that whole program over to the, to the government of Malawi, uh, um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and now that, uh, is is in deeply embedded within the Ministry of Health in Malawi, uh, and it is continuing. Remarkable. And and now um, you are with the Dadala Institute at York University and, and very much still involved in global health issues, one of which is climate change. Can you talk a little bit about that work? Yeah. So um, at the Dadala Institute, um, we're focused on, we have three big themes. Um, one is planetary health. The second is global health and humanitarianism. And the third is um, global health foresighting or imagining the future and then working toward that in very practical uh, 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 practical terms. So under planetary health, we have a, a very significant program that looks at we're, we're modeling the health impacts of climate change. And we're doing this also in Malawi. Um, and we're using a model called uh, agent-based modeling and system dynamics modeling, and now machine learning as part of that uh, to help us understand the um, relationship between meteorologic change driven by climate change uh, and then the downstream impacts on health. We're also looking at um, the impact of climate change uh, on um, food security. So what are the impacts uh, on crops, crop yields, um, and the quality of the crop. Uh, so what we're seeing, mm. just for example, is as climate change worsens, crop yields are diminishing, and also the quality of crops are, are diminishing. And then the, 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 so we're looking at infectious disease, food security, and then what we call extreme weather events. Uh, so, um, cyclones, hurricanes, floods, right. and drought. Um, so, what are the effects of cyclones, hurricanes, flood, and drought on health? Mm. Uh, and then the other area that we're working on um, is global health and humanitarianism. And there we're very much focused on water and water quality in refugee camps and internally displaced person settings. Wow. And then the third area uh, that I'll just mention very briefly, uh, global health foresight, um, uh, we're working uh, – uh, we did a whole bunch of work for about three years during the COVID pandemic uh, on modeling COVID in eight African nations and working with those governments um, to provide essentially daily policy prescriptions to those governments on how to deal with COVID in your country, in this city, in this neighborhood, you know. Oh my goodness. The, yeah. Your reach, the reach of your work is incredible. Um, you mentioned empathy and you are going to be speaking, uh, in person at the Roots of Empathy Symposium that's coming up on June 20th. And the, the overall theme of that symposium is empathy towards a more caring world. 
What do you believe is the role of empathy in humanitarian work? The, the more we feel for others, the more likely we are to act on their behalf when they can't act on their own, uh, for their own benefit. Um, and empathy is absolutely central uh, to, um, to cooperative, if you will, agency, to creating the causes and conditions uh, where it's possible for, for uh, our collective as, as human beings to improve, right? And to, 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 um, uh, to be better, uh, in, in so many different ways. Empathy is really, really core, uh, to, um, the openness, the willingness to see the other, right? To see, yeah. if you will, the sameness of self in many ways in the other, right? That we are actually, we do have a sameness. James, I just want to end off with something that you said many years ago. Uh, it was on your first trip to Rwanda, and you wrote that as long as we can imagine a better tomorrow, we can work towards a better tomorrow. After everything that you have experienced um, when we spoke about some of those experiences, how do you still stay hopeful and positive? Because it's possible to create a better tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> like it's manifestly true, right? That that if you, uh, uh, it's manifestly true that if you engage in the world with curiosity, uh, and with with a commitment uh, to new understanding, to new knowledge, not just of your of of outside yourself, but also of yourself. If you engage with curiosity, you 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 um, have a deeper, richer uh, uh, understanding with which you can do very concrete things, right? That improve uh, uh, the circumstances uh, that you yourself are in and also the circumstances that others are in. It's, it's like a, it's a self-evident truth that if you, if you try, there's a real possibility you might succeed. <laughs> We're going to end off on that. James, thank you so much for a brilliant discussion. Thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome. It's been a pleasure, Mary. Thank you. James Urbinski, medical doctor, humanitarian, activist, founding director of the Dadala Institute for Public Health Research at York University. For more information on James and his work, please check out our show notes. Uh, and don't forget that James is the keynote speaker coming up at the Roots of Empathy Symposium. It is on June the 20th. Uh, if you're watching virtually, it is free. So please register at rootsofempathy.org. That is it for our podcast today. You can follow us on social at Cram Ideas is our hashtag. Please rate our podcast as well. And thanks to the Temerty Foundation for their generous support. Thank you for joining us. See you back here next time.